Hey everyone, welcome to First Christian Church Online. We're so glad that you're here today. My name is Jordan and I'd love to connect with you. I um, want to encourage you today as you're watching the service to take a moment and reply to a chat, say hey to somebody in there. Um, we'd love to connect with you. Um, also, you can always hop on over to scottsburg.church. That's our website. And on there, there's an online connect card. Uh, and I personally would love to connect with you this week if you fill that out and let us know how we can walk with you. Um, like I said, great things today. It's going to be a great service. Thanks for being back with us. We're glad that you're here. Let's take a few moments here and worship God.
Hey guys, thanks for being here today. Thank you so much for joining us at First Christian Church Online. For those of you who are here with us every week, thank you so much for taking the time and staying connected to our family and to the FCC family via online church. We always want to tell you that we still got a place here for you in person. And um, but we we want to remind you that uh, we love you and we're here for you. So today, if you have a need or if you have a prayer concern or just want to say hello to us, um, we would love to hear from you. And you can do that with our chat host. Um, you can do that also um, by just sending in us a text with our FCC Connect. And um, most of you should have that number. If not, um, you can go to our website and, and get all that information. Um, if you're new today and you're first time watching us, thanks for giving us a chance and, and thanks for stopping by. Um, we would love to get to know you as well. And so you can go to scottsburg.church and uh, there is an online connect card there. And we would love to, to hear more about your story and, and your journey. Um, today, uh, we, we continue our, our series called Accidental Pharisees. And a few years ago, um, I, I read this book. Um, it's by Larry Osborne, um, but I, I've been rereading it. Uh, again, I, I don't necessarily um, hold to everything that he says, um, but but there's a lot of things in here that are challenging, and and I wanted to pull some of those um, more challenging thoughts and and truths out of that and, and share with with you guys, and because it, it meant a lot to me, and I hope it uh, has meant meant a lot to you. Today, we, we want to talk about um, something that we probably don't often think of, uh, just because it's not a word that we, we use all the time, and it's, it's zeal. Um, there was a couple of uh, people on the, the, the disciples, the early church, they were known as zealots. Um, and so zeal is not something that, that we often talk about, um, but it is something that we do. It's, it's something that we naturally do at times. We don't even know it. Um, but there is, um, there's two sides of zeal. There's a good side um, and there's a bad side. There's a dangerous side. And what I've come to realize is the more that I've read through the Bible, the more that I read, the, the more that I not, not just read but take time with sections of Scripture, um, they seem simple Right, they they seem simple, and and these sections you just kind of read through them really quick, and it gives you a lot of good things to do, and you know, care for one another, love one another, uh, carry one another's burdens, all these different kinds of things. We read through Scripture and we hear these, and we go, yeah, yeah, I, I can do that, I can believe that. But when it really comes down to applying them to actually living them out, um, what I've found is those simple parts of Scripture become a little bit more challenging. And I think for most of us, we, we want to follow what the Bible says. We, we want to um, do what the Bible says. We want to live a kind of life that, that God's proud of and that, that looks like Jesus a little bit. And um, we want to continue to be better and we want to continue to make changes in our life for the better. I think most people who, who love Jesus want to do that. The hard part is that we do that when things go good, when things are going great, when everything's seeming to roll our way. We have no problem um, with saying, yep, I agree with that. Yep, I can do that. Um, it, it's when things don't go our way, I think, when we, um, when we face difficult situations that these simple but yet challenging parts of Scripture are hard to really live out. I love what one person said. I was reading a, a book about zeal, and he says, um, our Lord is good, but he isn't safe. And I thought about that, and I thought about that one little phrase, he isn't safe. And I've really come to, to realize that, that God is good, but he isn't safe. He puts us into challenging positions um, to really make a difference. And sometimes we have to do some really hard things and we have to bite our tongue and we have to be gentle and we have to be kind and caring. Um, these are not safe places. 
These are actually very hard places to, to live in life. You think most of the time, well, it's easy to be kind. Is it? Is it really easy to be kind? Well, it's easy to be kind for the people that I love, sure. What about that person who who hates you? What about that person who just went on Facebook and blasted you? Is it easy to be kind then? Is it easy to, to turn the other cheek? Is it is it easy to show grace? It is for the people that I love, but for difficult people, for difficult situations, it can be a little challenging. And that's where the dangerous side of zeal comes in. When we get put into positions that aren't safe, that are outside of our wheelhouse. And this is the very place that I believe Timothy finds himself in when he is beginning his preaching career. When, he, when Paul places him in the position of authority in the church that he's at, Timothy finds himself in this difficult, challenging situation. But his spiritual mentor, Paul, his spiritual father, gives him some great advice, gives him some truth, and that's what I want us to look at today. And the reason we want to look at it is I think if we, if we can really dive in here for just a moment, we can do a better job of avoiding the dangerous side of zeal. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Now, um, this letter, 2 Timothy, it's, it's, it's short. It's, it's got a lot of stuff and detail there. Um, but it is so jam-packed full of, of what these little one-liners, right? And, and I want us to focus on some of them. Let's look at first, or 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. So never be ashamed to tell others about the Lord. And don't be ashamed of me either, even though I'm in prison for him. Paul is writing to Timothy. Timothy, don't, don't be ashamed to tell others about the Lord. With the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me for the sake of the good news. For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that his plan from the very beginning was to show us his grace through Christ Jesus. What I think we need to understand <clears throat> right from the very beginning, and, it, and I think it's one of the reasons Paul says it early on in this letter, we don't deserve the position that we have. We don't deserve our position of privilege. We have that position because of God's love and God's patience and his grace. We have that position because someone took the time to share with us that good news. And because of that, we now find ourselves in a position to share with others, to tell others about the Lord Jesus. So Paul says, don't be ashamed to tell others about me. Don't, don't be ashamed of, of me. People are going to look at me and, and say that I'm, I'm not what I am and I'm in prison and there's going to be false teachers out there. Don't be ashamed of me. Um, with the strength God gives you, be ready to suffer with me. And so Paul is laying this foundation for Timothy that, that just explains to him, Timothy, you've been given a great gift. And that gift, I want you to use it without being ashamed. I want you to be bold, but I want you to be bold like Jesus. And I think, I think the reason Paul understood this is because he came from being a Pharisee. He understood what zeal, zeal was. He, he understood what being a zealot was all about. So here's the deal. If we're going to share the good news, if we're going to tell others about Jesus, we have to understand the dangerous side of zeal, the ugly side of religion. Zeal's not a bad thing. But when zeal goes unchecked, it can actually do more harm than it does good. 
The definition of zeal is to have great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. But when that zeal goes wrong, it can actually do damage. Paul knows this. Paul understands this more than probably any other disciple. He was a very zealous Pharisee. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And what happens with us <clears throat> is that when, when it comes to the crossroads of our, um, our personal holiness and others, the, uh, other people's holiness, um, there's this frustration that can occur. What I mean, what I mean is this. We're trying to live our life like Jesus. We're, we're trying to live out the good news. We're trying to be like Jesus. And, and we're trying to make the right choices for ourselves. And, and maybe we, we adjust and, and we, we make a change in our life. Well, when we don't see that change happening in other people's lives, we can become frustrated. And when our frustration rises to the point of of being out of control, it, it moves from frustration to condemnation. We're no longer just frustrated with that person who's not doing what we're doing. We actually condemn them. We, we can actually cause them harm. We get frustrated when people don't become more like we are. Because as people, we really want other people to be like us. We want them to like the things that we like. We want them to do the things that we do. That's why we gravitate towards people who are like us. And when other people aren't like us, when other people treat us differently, it causes frustration. And that frustration grows. And when that person doesn't share the same conviction, when that person has a different lifestyle, it turns from frustration to condemnation. It turns to disgust. It turns to disdain for people who are not becoming more like you. We get frustrated when people don't share the same thoughts about ministry. You get frustrated when, when, when somebody has a, maybe a different idea about ministry than, than you do. Now, I'm talking to church folks here, right? We don't, we, we get frustrated when, when people don't share the same convictions about social matters. We get frustrated when we have different beliefs about what is good and right socially. We get frustrated when people don't share the same beliefs about family, discipline, education, service, money, job, etc. And that's the point. That's the dangerous, slippery slope. I don't know if you picked up on it or not. But it's at the point that our frustrations begin to be frustrated when people don't become more like we are, me. You see, I was never the standard. You're never the standard. But the dangerous side of zeal moves away from Jesus being the center to the person being the center. And that's not what God desires at all. Larry Osborne said it this way, inevitably, being right will become more important than following Jesus. Being right will become more important than being kind. You'll wanna be right more than you want to give grace. You'll want to be right more than you will want to, to love. He said thinning the herd will become more important than expanding the kingdom. Unity will take a back seat to uniformity. And if we're honest, there have been times in our history that that's the case. Not, not just locally here at First Christian Church, but but as a church in whole, there have been times when uniformity has taken first place and it's become more important than unity. Expanding the kingdom takes a back seat to thinning the herd. Paul to the Ephesians 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, Therefore I am a prisoner for serving the Lord. I beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Remember what I said. When things are going good, we have no problem with zeal. But it's when things get difficult that the dangerous side of zeal comes out. It's when we are not patient with one another. Excuse me. It's when we're not patient with one another. When we fail to be humble. I'm not always gentle. And it's in these moments that we're challenged by these words. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with one another. Make allowance for each other because you're not perfect. Everybody's going to make a mistake. The preacher's not always going to be right. That church leader's not always going to make the right decision. But you see, when we become the standard and when we fail to see God's standard, zeal becomes dangerous. It breaks my heart. It hurts when people that I deeply love turn on each other. It saddens me when people who have loved Jesus for a really long time turn on those who are trying to love Jesus for the very first time. I mean, we've all seen it. <laughs> Let's be honest. We've been part of it at times. We've all experienced it. This isn't something new. I mean, here's the kicker. This is the reason Paul wrote most of his letters, especially the one to the church of Ephesus. The Christians just couldn't get along. The, these new followers, they were having problems with each other, the Jewish Christians and the Gentile believers. They were destroying God's work because of their personal zeal, what they thought was right. And Paul had to correct them. He says in Ephesians chapter 4, he goes on, he says, listen, make every effort to keep yourselves united in the Spirit. He's talking to a church who is having trouble coming together. He actually uses the words, bind yourself together with peace. Literally, the thing that should bring you together is peace. The thing that should wrap you up is peace, unity. But in order to do that, in order to be united, we have to move beyond our personal zeal. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. The dangerous side of zeal comes out when we place ourselves ahead of life together with the body. You and I were never the center of God's community. It was never about just one person. It was about the kingdom. It was about the church. It was about the body together. But pride and Ego and self-importance gets in the way. That's not what God desires from us. Paul explains it in a very direct way to the church in Corinth. The church in Corinth was a mess. They were trying really hard, but they just weren't getting it right. They were fighting against each other, and they had internal squabbles and internal problems, and they had other, they had people going to other people's houses and they, they had people talking about, you know, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. Well, that guy's not any good. That guy's not any good. And, and there's just all this internal squabble. And I can imagine it was just driving God crazy. And so Paul talks to them. He talks to them about the most important thing ever. He says, listen. If, if I could speak all the languages of earth 
if I could speak in angelic languages, but I didn't love others, I would just be a noisy gong. I would be a clanging cymbal. It would just be a noise. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans, if I possessed all knowledge, and if I had faith that could really move mountains, but I didn't love others, Paul says, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, if I even sacrificed my own body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And then he goes into probably one of the most misquoted scriptures of, of all time. He said, love is patient. It's kind. If I truly loved you, I would be patient with you. I would be kind. I wouldn't lose my temper. You see, if I truly loved you, if I, if I truly understood that kingdom first mattered, I wouldn't be jealous or boastful or proud. I wouldn't be jealous about someone else in the church becoming successful. I wouldn't be proud or rude. See, Paul says love doesn't demand its own way. If I truly loved, it wouldn't be about me. Love's not irritable. And love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. You know, I, I think about when I first came here. A little over four years ago now. And people left before I even got here. They left because of somebody's decision or they left because of, I don't know, whatever reason. It doesn't sound very loving to me. When COVID happened, people left because of a decision made, because of a difference of opinion, because of a political view. It doesn't sound very loving to me. See, the challenging part of keeping a church together is keeping no wrongs, not having it our own way. Love doesn't rejoice in injustice, but love rejoices whenever truth wins out. I should be happy when you are successful, and I am. As a church, we should rejoice when someone grows in their faith. Whenever truth wins out, we should be the ones who are, are rejoicing. Remember, love's patient. Love's kind. It's not jealous or boastful. Love never gives up. That's why I keep going every day. Because I see people's lives changed. I hear stories of transformation. I hope that I'm always hopeful. And Paul says, love endures through every circumstance. At the end of the day, the dangerous side of zeal is when I replace love with self. It's no longer about loving one another. It's about me being right. You see, we're talking about accidental Pharisees, and, and I don't want us to miss this point, because if we fail to 
misunderstand this, then, then we will probably be in danger of missing the whole purpose of this series. If we fail to see how spiritually impressive the Pharisees were, we will remain blind to the danger of becoming like them. You see, Paul talks to the church about he could have he could have do a he could he could do a lot of things, but if he didn't have love, he would be nothing. And I don't want you to forget that the Pharisees of old saw themselves as God's biggest fans. If they said we love, if, if they were asked, "Do you love God?" they would have answered emphatically, "Yes, with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength." They were God's biggest fans. They were the ones praising God. The Pharisees were the ones who were worshiping him night and day in the temple. They were the teachers of teachers. They were the ones who were sacrificing. They spoke out in God's defense. They spoke against idolatry and immorality. They they spoke against evil of the world. They were not terrible people. Yet when Jesus showed up, they vehemently opposed him. And they ultimately killed him. Why? Because they were blinded by zeal. And that is the dangerous side of zeal. That our enthusiasm for God causes us to be blind. Causes us to miss out on what God is actually trying to do. How do we avoid becoming dangerously zealous? How do we avoid our zeal, our enthusiasm? How do we avoid it becoming dangerous? Number one, enjoy people with pure hearts. When was the last time you actually enjoyed people? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Run from anything that stimulates useful lust. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. Enjoy the companionship of those who love the Lord. Run away. Chase after justice and faith and love. Chase after peace. Run away from those things that pull you from God. Enjoy people with pure hearts. Number two, avoid stupid arguments. (laughs) Paul tells Timothy, again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. N.T. Wright said it's unprofitable. It's not worth anything. And you know what produces fights. Sometimes you pick a fight just to pick a fight. (laughs) Don't do it. Avoid it. He says that the Lord's servant must not be a fighter. Well, if I'm not to be a fighter, what am I to be? Well, Paul tells us, the scripture tells us, Number three, be gentle, be kind. Remember, love is patient and kind. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, when you talk to the church, be gentle to all people. You must be able to teach them, Timothy. You must able you must be able to bear evil without resentment. Again, remember when I said that these simple things seem simple except in application. When life gets challenging, when life gets difficult, these these simple statements don't don't seem so simple. 
I must be able to bear evil without resentment. Literally being patient with difficult people. (laughs) Tomorrow when you go to work, I want you to apply. Be patient with difficult people. Paul tells Timothy, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Correct those who are opponents of God. And he says, perhaps God will change their hearts. Remember last week we said the most important thing is our hearts. Be gentle, be patient. Maybe they'll learn the truth. And then Paul says they will come to their senses. And that's really what God wants. I need to be zealous. I need to have zeal. I need to have enthusiasm and excitement for Jesus. But I should never miss the point. It's never about all of the things. It's never about me being right. It's never about what I want. The dangerous side of zeal replaces the kingdom with me. And when I become the center, when it's what I want and the way I want it, I have missed out on what God truly desires. And that is unity in the church. I'll close with this. It's from Larry's book. The bottom line is that as long as my only image of a Pharisee is that of a spiritual loser and a perennial enemy of Jesus, I'll never recognize the clear and present danger in my own life. I'll never realize that it's often a very short and subtle journey from being zealous for God to being unintentionally opposed to God. How do you avoid the dangerous side of zeal? You remember what Paul told us. And you remember that without love, he would be nothing. I could be a lot of things, but without love, I would be nothing. So be patient. Make every effort to be united together. For there is one body one spirit, one glorious hope. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and one Father of all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. This week, I don't know what you're going to face. you're going to come across or who you're going to come across. But don't let zeal push someone from Jesus. Let zeal, your enthusiasm and excitement for the Lord, be the very thing that they want so badly that they will ask. Live in such a way you will preach the gospel but never have to use a word thanks for being here God bless you see you next time we're so glad that you've been here with us today it's been a great service I hope that something today um, has has touched you moved you in a way that you want to respond Um, if you want to take your next step 
Um, just know that we would love to be right there with you and, and answering any questions. Um, maybe you want to know more about baptism or following Jesus or just what it means to be a Christian. Um, know that we're here for you, and there's some easy ways for you to connect with us. Uh, all you have to do, you can type a comment there in the chat, and we would just be happy to follow up with you. You can always go to the website. It's up there all the time at scottsburg.church, right there on the homepage, online connect card. All you got to do is fill that out. Um, And I personally, I'll be in touch with you this week to see how we can help you in your next steps in following Jesus. And uh, it would just be an honor and joy to do that with you. Um, Thanks for being with us today. We're going to be back again next week. And we look forward to seeing you there. Have a great one. God bless. We'll see you soon. Thank you.